Let's take our Bibles and look together in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Just hop, skipping, and jumping as the Lord directs here through the Old Testament as he impresses my heart and mind concerning certain portions of Scripture from which we can draw parallels with the gospel and with the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today's study in 1 Samuel chapter 8, and I want to read from verse 1 down to the end of the chapter, verse 22, and I've entitled this, Rejecting God's King. There is a king that God has set upon his throne, as it says there in Psalm 2, through whom he rules and reigns and directs all things, and that's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at this time here in 1 Samuel chapter 8, Christ had not yet come to this earth. And yet, as we've been seeing, all of the Old Testament is full of types and pictures and promises and prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And that in the Old Testament, it tells us that he was coming, and in the New Testament, it tells us that he has come, and that he has fulfilled all that pertain to him throughout the scriptures. This is a rule of interpretation that Christ himself gave to his disciples after his resurrection as they walked along that road to Emmaus and uh, their eyes were holden so as not to be able to know him. And yet, as he walked with them and talked with them in Luke chapter 24, it tells us that he spoke to them of those things that pertain to him from the scriptures. One particular key verse is in Luke 24 and verse 27, and beginning at Moses, and all the prophets. So Moses speaks there of the five books of the Old Testament called the Pentateuch. And then the prophets. Well, that's all the other books of the Old Testament. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures. That word scriptures means writings. So that pertains to this inspired word that we're reading here. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That gives us what it is to preach faithfully the scriptures. It's to take what's in these scriptures and to preach Christ. Not only his person, but his work that he came to accomplish that he might satisfy God's law and justice. That's what all the sacrifices are about in the Old Testament. And the priesthood and the temple, all that was given as a visible place of worship for the children of Israel, and for us to go back and read about, pertain to Christ. And so we dare not take any portion of Scripture and preach it as if it's just a narrative or if it's just history or information. No, it pertains to Christ. And that's what I want us to see here in 1 Samuel chapter 8, because God had purposed a king for Israel, and that king would be David. And David, of course, we know it was through his seed. Christ is called the seed of David that our Lord Jesus Christ would come. But here in 1 Samuel 8 and verse 1, it came to pass was when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. I remember our last study, we were actually studying Hannah there in the first chapter of Samuel, 1 Samuel, how she had asked the Lord for a child, and the Lord had granted her that child. She named him Samuel, and that word means ask of God. And he remained there. Remember, she said that if the Lord would give her this child, she would take him and give him to the 
tabernacle and uh, that he would serve with Eli the priest who was at the same time not only priest but the prophet of God and if we go back a little bit here some time has passed but in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 11 and then again in chapter 3 and verse 1 we find that Samuel, the child, and Elkanah went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. So even Samuel here can serve as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in his office, serving unto the Lord through Eli the priest, Christ as prophet, priest, and king. And Samuel was not only God's prophet, but here he ministered unto the Lord as a priest and as a judge, as a king, if you will, in Israel. So that's where we find him. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 3, in verse 1, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And it says the word of the Lord was precious in those days. In other words, rare. It's like a precious stone. You don't find it lying on the surface. Unlike today, where everybody claims to be speaking for the Lord. But this word is precious. In other words, in the scriptures, it's revealed, but it's for those that God has purposed to hear. There was no open vision at this time. So you can see that Eli was quite old. And he had failed to discipline his sons, and so the Lord slew him. A lot has happened here between chapter 1 and chapter 8 that we're looking at. First Samuel chapter 3, in verses 10 through 14, it says, The Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. This is the story that many people know about in Scripture. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. That's what Eli told him to say whenever he heard the Lord speaking. In the previous verses, he'd go to Eli. And finally, Eli recognized that it was the Lord that was speaking to Samuel. And so he told him to go lie down in verse 9. And it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And that's what he answered, speak for thy servant heareth. Now the message that he had to deliver to Eli was not a message that would be easy because the Lord would announce through Samuel to Eli that he was going to not only slay his sons, but that the Ark of the Covenant would be taken by the enemy. The Lord said to Samuel in verse 11, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. There was a certain presumption there in Israel that everything was fine and going along the way they wanted it. But the Lord's announcing that he would bring judgment in a way that when people heard of it, their ears would tingle. That's not a message that people want to hear today. They want to come, sit, and listen, want to be made to feel better, go away feeling better, particularly about themselves but to preach unto them a holy God who's just and must condemn sin and that apart from the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no satisfaction. That brings a divide. It's not a message that people want to hear and yet it's a message that any that are the Lord's must preach. I often say the gospel is a double-edged sword. It preaches the salvation of God in the Lord Jesus Christ, but it also declares the condemnation of those that are not Christ's and that walk in this world according to their own desires and according to their own will. It's like one man said to me one time, well, why doesn't God just leave the choice to us? Well, if he does, that's certain condemnation. It's not a way of blessing. But he says in verse 12 to Samuel, in that day, I will perform against Eli all things 
which I have spoken concerning this house. When I begin, I will also make an end. So here was Eli, a priest that was in a place of service under the Lord, and yet the Lord had somewhat against him. Just because he was in that role doesn't mean that he was necessarily under God's blessing, like so many in Israel, going through the motions, going through the performances of religion, and yet their hearts not being taught of God. And verse 13, I've told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall be purged with sacrifice, shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. That's quite a condemnation. I don't know what Eli's final state was before the Lord, but I know here this word of condemnation condemned him and his house and that no amount of sacrifice or offering could ever purge. In other words, just going through the rituals of sacrifice could ever purge him or his house. And so that's where the Lord, as you read on, slew Eli and his sons. But Samuel then in verse 19 of 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 19 to 21, that's where it says, and Samuel grew. We don't know how old Samuel was. It calls him the child. And some estimate that he would have been around 30 years old were he to enter into the ministry after having served Eli during that time. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. I love how that's put. That everything that God in his sovereignty has purposed to do, he does. Not one word that we find even here in Scripture is going to fail. The problem is where people come to this word, and they put in God's mouth certain things that they say he promises, and then when it doesn't come to pass, there's all those preachers that will say, well, you just didn't have enough faith. We have to be careful when we read the scriptures and when we interpret the scriptures, not to impose our own views and thoughts upon them. It's the word of God that shall stand and not one of his words shall ever fail, ever fall to the ground as if somehow now it's not fulfilled. In Isaiah, he declared that God will prosper his word in all that he sent it to do. Here's where preachers misinterpret the word because they say, well, God wants everybody to be saved. And they use this word to try to prove that. But then when all are not saved, they say, well, God's not going to overrule with man's unbelief. Well, if God doesn't overrule with unbelief, then there's none will be saved because we're all unbelievers by nature. What Isaiah was declaring the word of the Lord is that it prospers in the thing for which he sent it. There are some that he's purpose should be a word of salvation. And if any of us do trust in Christ today, it's because God purposed that word should not fail. But also we're reminded that God has purposed that his word serve for condemnation to others, for salvation to some, for condemnation to others. What's certain is his word shall not fail. He's going to accomplish his purpose in the thing for which he is sent. We just don't know how God's going to use his word. There's some that can be, the term I use is gospel hardened. They hear the gospel, and yet the more they hear it, the more hardened they become because left to their own devices, to their own will, they'll never come to Christ. Only those that God has purposed to save and by his spirit gives them that faith to look to Christ will come to him. Otherwise, men will continue in darkness. 
And so with regard to Samuel, it says he grew and did let none of his words fall to the ground. The Lord did let none of his words fall to the ground. I'm not talking about Samuel, as we're going to see, Samuel had his faults. Even in how he raised his children and his sons. And this is coming back now to our chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 8. It says, in all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be the prophet of the Lord. How did they know that he was, notice, established to be the prophet of the Lord? How do we know today those that God has established to be his servants? Well, it's in declaring Christ, in the, not wavering in his message at all in trying to favor the people for what they wanted. And that's really where this conflict is going to build here in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And it says the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle stayed for hundreds of years until David was raised up. And through David, Solomon, and the temple was built in Jerusalem. It says, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And there we see the word of the Lord. Who is the word of the Lord? The Christ. It's through Christ. This was the spirit of Christ that was in him. As Peter says, they had the spirit of Christ in them. So Samuel was, by God's grace and mercy, a faithful prophet of God all the days of his life. If you look in 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verses 15 through 17, it says, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah and judged Israel in all those places. Again, Samuel's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ as prophet, priest, and king. Here we see him not only as a prophet, but as the judge. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel. And notice, there he built an altar unto the Lord. That's his priestly work of offering up sacrifices on behalf of the people that the Lord had given him to rule over. But when he was old, as we come now into 1 Samuel chapter 8, and he made his sons to judge over Israel, but like Eli's sons, they perverted judgment actually taking bribes, and this displeased the Lord. That's what we find here as we read on in 1 Samuel 8, beginning with verse 2. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba, and his sons walked not in his ways. Here's where we can see that even in a family where the father may be the Lord's, it doesn't necessarily mean that the children are going to be the Lord's. It's the Lord that makes the difference. And it says they turned aside after lucre, that would be bribery, and took bribes and perverted judgment. And so it's in this context then, and, and here's where we see, again, God's sovereign grace and mercy because Samuel's sons didn't follow after the Lord, and yet the Lord didn't judge Samuel, but judged his sons. Eli, in his case, the Lord judged them all, Eli and his sons, and cut his name off from Israel. As a result, you say, well, what makes the difference? God makes the difference. God is not a cookie-cutter God to where just because he worked in this way at this time, that, that means he's going to do it the same way that time. The one thing we know about God is his judgments are always true and right. If someone said it's true because God has declared it to be true, and it's true because it's right because God is always right in what he does. So this is why 
Now we read that the elders of Israel, they came to Samuel and rejected. So even this God used to bring out a rebellion that was already in the elders of Israel. They were blaming Samuel's sons for being in rebellion when they themselves would be proven to have a rebellious heart. Here it says in verse four, then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and Ramah. And they said unto him, behold, thou art old. So just because he was old, they were thinking that they need to take matters in their own hands without looking to God as to who would be that prophet that should replace him. I know that we can even fall in that mindset today where there are so few preachers today that God has raised up to declare his true and distinct gospel of his son. I've had people ask me that. Well, you're getting up in years. <laughs> and uh, who do you think is going to replace you when you're gone? I have no clue. I don't know what God will be pleased to do after I'm gone. All I know is that he's given me today and I'm here declaring unto you the same message that he was pleased to reveal to me many years ago in my heart. And as long as he gives me breath, I'll continue to declare his glory. But let's beware of trying to take matters in our own hands and think, well, when he's gone, then we're going to have to go out and find somebody. That's the problem. God had already purposed how it was that he was going to bless through his king, his prophet, which would be David, that he would raise up. But they said unto him in verse 5, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us, and here it is, like all the nations. There's the problem when people get their eyes off of God who's on his throne and directing all things and has already purposed that his son should reign. And they go about now looking around and seeing how everybody else is worshiping and they begin to adopt those ways and practices. That's called apostasy, a falling away from what God has ordained. And so this matter actually had already risen before during the days of Gideon and the judges. If you look back in Judges chapter 8 and verses 22 and 23, this is why I say it was always in their heart. And so it is in, in the depraved heart of sinners that they would seek to take matters in their own hands and establish a king after their own heart. Beware here even of following after a popular Jesus that, as here it says, like the nations around them, they had their gods, they had their kings. But beware of following kings or little G-O-D-S gods that the world worships, even the name in the name of Christ, but it's not the Christ of Scripture. This isn't anything new. In Judges chapter 8 and verses 22 and 23, it says, And the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. So they were trying to seize on Gideon that the Lord had raised up as a judge. But Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. What? The Lord shall rule over you. And you come over here to 1 Samuel chapter 8, you can see how their request for another king, this shows that the spirit of Christ was in Samuel as God's prophet. He knew that God had his king, that he had purpose to sit upon his throne. And it wasn't just with reference to David. As you continue to read the prophecies 
that Samuel gave, it was all forward looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was given that same faith to look beyond his day to the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, just like Abraham, where the Lord said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. And so here in 1 Samuel 8 and verse 6, the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Here we see him as an intercessor. Again, in that priestly role, interceding on behalf of this people and looking to the Lord to judge in the matter. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people. Perhaps this is of a surprise when you read this. And I'm sure even Samuel, as he heard the response from the Lord, he's saying, hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. Here's a warning that not necessarily all answered prayer is a blessing. There are those that say they prayed and God blessed and gave them what they want. That's not necessarily a blessing. That could be a judgment, even as here it was a judgment. Because he says, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Again, getting back to the title of this study, God's King Rejected, Rejecting God's King. There is that king that God has set upon his holy hill. And the command is that sinners should bow unto him. But only those bow we know in whom is the spirit of God. Just like here with Samuel. He was set apart and distinct from this others. This thing that they asked displeased him. Just like when we see others running around and worshiping or attempting to worship God in their own way, in their own manner. Just like the religion of Cain bringing the fruits of their hands. It does displease those of us that the Lord has taught. And yet, here it's not rejecting us as we warn people of their false way, having been in that way ourselves for some time until it pleased God to reveal Christ in us. But the bottom line issue is that God should not reign over them. That's the problem that this generation today has. They don't have a problem with preaching to Jesus that is loving and waiting for them to come to him and won't they please give their heart to the popular Jesus. But declare unto men and women today that the Lord Jesus is upon his throne and he has authority over all flesh to give eternal life unto as many as the Father has given him. That Lord in Christ, they reject, even as when Christ was in his day, they would not have him to reign over them. The same spirit is in men today. And the Lord reminds Samuel that this is not a rejection of Samuel. I know many times as a preacher, when people oppose the message that I preach and take offense and speak out against you, the Lord reminds me that it's not me that they are rejecting, but it's him. It's, his, it's him and his sovereignty. It's him and the glory that he's purposed for his son and that He'll save none apart from those that he's given to his son and for whom Christ came into this world and paid the sin debt. So beware when the Lord gives people the desire of their heart but sends leanness to their soul. As we read on here in verse 8, according to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. I know that unbelief, when it manifests itself, may seem surprising, particularly in congregations where God has purpose that his gospel be preached. I have to remind 
even the congregation here in Shreveport all the time, that just because they're in a building and they're under the hearing of the gospel doesn't mean that they're necessarily the Lord's. In fact, most often, even as here, where the gospel is declared, it's a mixed congregation where there's wheat, there are tares, where there's sheep, there's goats. I don't try to sort it out and distinguish who is and who isn't. I'd be wrong in doing so. But all I know is there is that art of unbelief even among those like here that had through types and pictures the testimony of God concerning his son and yet forsook him and served other gods. Who knows what's in this heart? This heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? That would be our case were it not for, again, the grace of God. Now, therefore, he says, hearken unto their voice, how be it, yet protest solemnly unto them and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. They want a king? Then show them the manner of the king. And you can go over and read 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 19, all the way through chapter 12, and verse 17. What kind of king Saul was that they demanded and the Lord gave to them, but he ruled for their condemnation. And that's what happens when God gives sinners over to their own reprobate mind. It's for their condemnation. You don't want God giving you what you want, nor do I. My prayer is that his grace bring me to bow to him as sovereign and to his son that he has put upon his throne. And so Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots, and he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. In other words, you're going to be slaves. Here's a picture of works religion where people want a certain preacher. They like how he looks, how he appears. And so they have these pulpit committees. They go out and they find someone to their liking. They have itching ears is the way Paul puts it. They'll not endure sound doctrine. And what those preachers do is put people in bondage. They want a king. They want somebody like this. And he puts them to work. And uh, they'll serve him. They don't serve the Lord. They'll serve him. That's what works religion is. What a great difference there is between coming and sitting and listening to a message that exalts the Lord Jesus Christ who came and finished the work. And those that are taught of the Lord, rest in him. The preacher's not imposing works on the hearers, but rather exhorting them to look to Christ and rejoice in his finished work. Ah, what a blessing for sinners whom the Lord has so taught. But others that reject Christ as he set forth in scripture and they go down the road and they're gonna find somebody to their liking, beware. That's what Samuel's saying here. He'll take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. I think about modern religion, what these organizations have become. Boy, they need cooks, they need bakers. They need people serving, and that's what's preached all the time. We've got this project, and we've got that. They call it a ministry. And they get people working and doing it, coming and going. You'll take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards. That's what preachers do in imposing their tithes and making people give pledges, giving their fields, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he'll take the tenth of your seed, there it is, the tithe of your, and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. Think about the staffs it takes to run these organizations today. 
And so people need to be given. They're going to support the minister of youth. They're going to support the minister of music. They got the senior minister, the assistant minister, all these things. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. That's the call today. We need more people out in the field working, going across the seas, all this raising money. He'll take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. That's what it is. It's a bondage. Some people don't realize how much of a bondage it is until the Lord delivers them. And we've got those in our congregation that will tell him that from time to time. We're so thankful how the Lord has delivered us out from the bondage we are in and works religion. And now just to come and rejoice to hear of Christ and, and know that every time we come, that's who we're going to hear. God's king. The one that he has purposed to honor and has honored through his finished work accomplished for his people. But on the other side, and you know family members and others that are still caught up in this works religion. And they'll talk to you sometimes and complain about it. And all you can say is, well, why do you continue to subject yourself to that bondage? Here it says in verse 18, ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. That's... God shutting men up to what they desire and therefore not hearing their cry. There's only one cry the Lord's ever going to hear, and that's the cry of the, the sinner. Be merciful to me, be sinner. As Christ said, that publican went down to his house justified rather than the other, that Pharisee that stood in the temple and looked down his nose and thanked God he wasn't like that. Publican. Nevertheless, here it is, rejecting God's king. The people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, nay, but we will have a king over us. That's what sinners do when they hear of the sovereign Christ in all of his glory. And yet they say, no, I prefer to believe in free will. I don't want to believe in a king who makes the decision as to who's saved and who's not. I don't want to believe in a, in a king that laid down his life for some, but not everybody. That's not fair. We won't have that king. Well, that's the same thing we have here. Nay, it says in verse 19, but we will have a king. They'll have a king over them, but it's not going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that mean then that somehow he is not ruling and reigning? No. In his sovereignty, then, he gives them over to their own reprobate minds. And they willingly have it so. It's like Christ said to the Pharisees, you will not come. You cannot come, but it's because you will not come. And none will, unless it's the Father that draws it. There in John chapter 6. But here they said, nay, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all nations. See, this is another thing about being separated unto the Christ of Scripture. It's a life of isolation. And unless the Lord has truly taught a sinner, they're not going to be able to endure long this separation, this isolation, meeting in such small numbers. They've got to be, as they drive by all these other places of worship, they've got to be, thinking about, well, you know what? It may be a whole lot more fun to go there. Or maybe they have something there that would be better for my children. All these thoughts that eventually, what they do is they abandon that place where God has purposed that the name of his son should be glorified and they're right off following the crowd. But remember, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Don't be tempted just because there are a lot of cars in the parking lot or a lot of people in attendance. That was the problem here in verse 20, that we also may be like them, like all the nations. 
and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. People say there's strength in numbers, and so that's how these continue to impose themselves on the world. These large so-called ministries that are worldwide with so many people contributing. People look at that and think, well, boy, I'd rather be part of that. And it says Samuel heard all the words of the people and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. So here we have him as the mediator, crying unto the Lord, and yet the people coming to him and saying, tell the Lord this. And the Lord said to Samuel, again, hearken unto their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, go every man unto his city. Boy, that's, that's not a blessing. That's a condemnation. Everybody go on and do whatever you're going to do. There's times where in preaching, you see people leave. And they go their way. Don't go running after them. Don't think that somehow you're going to change their mind. If you've declared unto them the Christ of Scripture, and he is declared as the king, God's king, that he has set upon his throne. And that from eternity, God purposed that there be one king that should reign over this world and over his people, and that's his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But beware when people go their own way and think that somehow they're going to have a better life by doing what they want to do. Well, Christ is the king of kings and the Lord of lords and exalted that way. And those that reject him, they do so to their own peril, to their own condemnation. Thank God if he's given you his spirit to cause you to bow and to know Christ, first of all, and to bow to him and rejoice that he is the king and that all things are in his hands and that he's accomplishing his purpose to the glory and honor of his son. So we're going to stop there for now and I pray that we'll refer to the Lord who will indeed bless our hearts.